Okay, finally we're going to get around to connecting our PHP files, programs, cases, models, everything, connecting them to the database. All of the components that we've been looking at are all going to be still a big factor, particularly the models. We'll be creating models for all of this. All of our data access happens through the models. The models collect the data, put it into an array. We give the array to the view, and the view shows everything. It's kind of our ultimate goal. You might remember from RDD, the employees database that we use there with plants and trips and employees. It's basically the same database. If you still have it, it should be functional. And this, by the way, also has embedded in it my states table. If you ever want to steal one, this is a good place to get it from. It does have all the different kind of stuff there, including if it's a Canadian province, a territory, or a United States abbreviation. So all that's in there. Once you've got that imported, remember you have to use you don't have to use MySQL Workbench if there's another way, maybe command prompt or something to bring that data in. Good luck to you. Right. To me, this is the easy way. You just open that SQL file that I gave you, execute the whole thing, and poof, you get a database. <clears throat> Once that's done, you really don't need the Workbench, but I think I will keep it around just in case I have questions about the data. We can look at the actual tables themselves. That file was yeah, on OneDrive. You downloaded the SQL file, the uh, employees SQL. The, the database that you said to execute. That? That's the SQL file, the one I just closed. So yeah, I'm going to open it. here and I'm going to find, please, I'm going to find that file that I downloaded. There it is, the import employees. Oh, yeah. Just click on that and then that same thing comes in here. Then you hit the lightning bolt, executes it, and then you have a database. All right. To get access to a database, the modern way to do it, PHP version 5, which is now hardly modern anymore. It's been around a long time. But there are, you might, when you look on the web, see other ways of doing data access. The correct way to do it is to use the PDO class. PDO stands for PHP Data Objects. So this manages, helps us access the database. There are other ways to do it. They're the old school. This is a new school. We're building new stuff, so we're going to use this. First thing we have to learn how to do is connect to a database. And so what we are going to do is create some variables. I'm going to fly through this here just briefly, and then we'll come back. We're going to define the username and the password for the database. And then we create a new PDO object using all that information. And then a little later, we actually execute that. And when we execute it, hopefully we won't get any errors. But if we do, we're going to intercept them. Now, instead of making you type all this nonsense, it's already in the sample that I gave you. So this is the Unit 6 sample for 2015. In the Models folder, there is a Connect Employees PHP file. First note that this is not a function. Primary reason it's not a function is this DSN variable, or actually this DB variable, excuse me, that DB variable is going to be global and we're going to access it every time we execute a query. So this is kind of like building the connection string and having a pointer to our database that we did when we did this in C Sharp. Very similar concepts. Here's the command that I showed you just a minute ago. This is just a variable name. We're always accessing MySQL. We want to designate the host. And in this case, I'm setting it to local host, which means I'm running off my Apache server or my MySQL server. The database name then follows that. So when you're building your own, you steal this, change the database name. If you're running off of your flash drive, you're probably using username root and password unless you changed them on your flash drive for some reason. Most people don't. You just created a connection. Your username became root and your password was empty. That makes it real simple for us. I've also provided for you the connection string that I use to access FatCow. Not that you're going to access FatCow, but so that you can see what changes. What changes is localhost. This address I got from Fat Cow when they said, here's your website, here's your name, here's how you get to SQL, here's how you get to FTP, here's how you do all that stuff. 
once again, a database name. And then, of course, up there, I'm required to have a password, username, and a password, unlike the local ones. What I do when I'm ready to post this is simply uncomment these lines. I don't even bother to comment those out because these are just variables. So I set them to one thing, and then 30 billions of a second later, I set them to the ones that are live. And so to move my database to the web, the only thing I have to change is this connection string file. I modify those three lines, take the comments off, and this should function when I move it to my server. So it works pretty well. This little guy here is an options. When we open our database, we have the ability to create options. If there's a problem with the database, it doesn't want to open, got the wrong name, the wrong password, you don't get any error messages, it's just an exception is thrown and they're really hard to read. Then I discovered this option or this opportunity here to create an array of options and this option says, if there's an error, send me a warning. The alternative is exception. I think you can say error mode exception here. And it throws an exception, but the exceptions are about as easy to read as Swift exceptions. Where if you go with the warning, it'll actually give you line numbers, table names, whatever it is it couldn't figure out. It'll give you a little bit more information. So this is just a given, at least in my mind. My notes say maybe when everything's working, you take it out. I don't. I leave it in. You may have seen this message once or twice when you go to Fat Cow. When I try to create my new database connection using that DSN, that username, that password, those options, when I try to do this, if there's an error, I catch it, I grab the message, and I display it using my own headers and footers just so it still looks like it's on the page. And this basically, and I just you can display anything you want here. I just display a quick message saying, it seems to be something goofy with my database. Every now and then it goes down. If you see this message when you're running localhost, something's wrong. Maybe MySQL died on you and you need to go launch the server again. Maybe you got the wrong flash drive in and you don't have the database. I don't know. But you shouldn't see this, but it does give you a clue to what's wrong and this message gets displayed down here as well. So you can look at the message and hopefully figure out what's missing. So the key part here are the one, two, three, four parameters and then the new PDO is an instantiation of a data connection. And that pointer gets stored in a variable called DB. All of these variables are global. The other ones, the DSN username password options, we don't use. But the DB is the pointer that we use to connect to the database every time we run a query. How do I make it global? By not putting it in a function. This is PHP. I'm in no function here whatsoever. Since this is not a function, it's a global variable, and we have to designate in the functions that we write later that I want to use that global variable. So technically, your DSN username and password are also global. They're also global. And you're saying just the PHP library is global? As long as it's not in a function, it's global. Could I rewrite these so those aren't out there? Maybe, but those are pretty small. They're not, they're strings for the most part. They're not going to kill anybody, so I just leave them there. <coughs> most of this comes out of Murak with some tweaks. So if all goes well here, and notice this is PHP, so it just executes. There's no function here. It executes immediately. If all goes well, we should have a connection to the database. If it doesn't go well, then we get our error message. You can see it on the screen. Why is your NPHP closing thing at the bottom underneath your closing bracket? Can you catch? This one here? It's PHP on the top. It's a PHP oh, file. Okay, never mind. I didn't see that. Okay. okay. I just didn't, I didn't indent it because it's all PHP. Right, right. To use this, you simply throw it. I put it in the index. Right away. There's very little, if anything, that I do in my website that doesn't require a database connection. There's very few pages that don't include data. If they don't have data on them, they're just pretty stuff, or maybe it's, even if it's a report, to get the data to generate the report, I gotta access a database. So there's very, I, I can't imagine a page that doesn't have data access. So that's why I put this 
Connect employees. And I just changed the name because every connection is a little different, right? Because we changed the database name at the very least. So I add the name of the of the table or the database, excuse me, to the end of the connect command. That's just my connection. That's just the function name or the include file name. And I bring it in. Because it doesn't have functions in it, it immediately executes and connects me to the database as soon as I hit the index page. I also make a link to my utilities because those come in handy just about everywhere. This one could move around a little bit, but last year we had it sitting right inside the controller so that everything we did brought in those utility functions that are in there. Those are PHP utilities. I had grand plans of converting this over to all the new things that we've learned, including bootstrap and including constants and HTML5 and five hours just wasn't enough to do all that because this still had a lot of the other old techniques in it, never updated it. The good news is it ought to be close enough. The point is not bootstrap. The point is not HTML5 with all of its constants. I will try to maybe plug those in here later. That's not the point. The point is how do I connect to the database? And then once I'm connected to the database, how to go get the data, get it out, and actually do something with it. That will not change if I'm using HTML5 with its constants. That will not change if I'm using Bootstrap. The only thing that might change, I still hope to sneak in on you here, is our duplicate record check using AJAX. So that we do it from the server asynchronously to see if this is a duplicate record. My 111 steps don't cover that, but... I got three weeks to figure that one out. I figure this go, This is just unit five. There's still or six. There's still unit seven. And for those of you who came in a little late, I plan to just plow through ahead in this class until we finish them. My guess is about three weeks. So we'll see how it goes. So the rest of the controller, nothing real magical here. Do we have an action variable? If we do, then process it. Otherwise, what kind of table are we messing with? What kind of action are we messing with? Is it an employee action or a trip action? I don't have anything here for plants. Plants are plant IDs and plant names. It's just a lookup table. The concepts will be the same. So this is the last look we have in here because we don't need to be back in here at all. What we need to worry about is the actual cases files for the database that we're messing with and initially we're going to be using employees. So I'm going to close that one down and just go to the employee cases. And in the employee cases I now bring in my employee model file and I also bring in the plants. The reason I need to bring in the plants is because that's where the plant list comes from which is stored in a combo box. Now, right now, both of these, the get plants and get employee details, both of those are just generating dummy data. They're not going to the database. Just a quick review. I should be able to launch this. And that's what it looks like. And it doesn't do anything else. If you hit save, it tells you you hit save. Congratulations. I did add some validation to this, uh, most of it's jQuery now, I, though I did retain the old validation that I had in here with all its links and stuff, so it kind of links the old way. Just changed the dollar to EL and off I went. Just didn't have enough time to change everything to jQuery. But everything else should be pretty accurate, plus if you try to leave, I have my are you sure um, jQuery linked into this so I can't leave. I can, but it asks me if I want to leave the page if I have a dirty page. So that much has already been tied in. I'll show it to you when we get there. Questions so far? All right, back to the notes. We did all this. Catching the exceptions, that was the options that I created. And then this just covers, there's the try catch, and you can throw anything in here you want. Usually a good idea to display the message.
So we did that. This is not a function. DB is a global variable. That's one we use from now on. We just talked about that. The other thing that happens when we run uh, PDO, if PDO by default runs in what's called silent mode, if you make SQL errors, and of course, you're never going to make any of those, any more than I do. If you make SQL errors, they're silent. You don't see anything. It just gives you nothing. There is a way to turn that off. A couple of ways to turn it off. We can turn it off by every time we execute a PDO or a PDO command, we could set the error code. If it's, we can check to see if there's an error code and then echo it. Well, that's annoying because we're going to have SQL commands in just about every function, sometimes two or three of them, and have to enter that every time just to see if I've got an SQL error is annoying. So instead, we turn on those options that I was talking about earlier. All right. And here's the exception version of that. And a little later in my notes, I say I like the warning version of that. So error mode warning. And that's what we had in the connection string to say if there's any SQL errors, display them for me. And we'll test that when we get around to it. We'll write some bad SQL, put a bad table name, maybe you'll get that information. Kind of what MySQL browser gives or Workbench gives you when you make mistakes. Not always 100% clear, but nowhere near as cryptic as the exceptions. So a lot of text to explain that. I think it's easier just to look at the code. The controller itself doesn't include any database access commands. The views don't include any database access commands. All the database access is done through the model files. So if you want to generate a list, one of the first things we're going to do, and I should probably look at my steps here to see where the heck I am. Open connections did that, discuss them, prepare statements. Okay, we're getting there. So, so far I'm doing okay. One thing I didn't show you, nothing to show you there. I did in the employees view, not that we care too much here. This is the details view. All I did is move the JavaScript down to the end. And this does import my, I did change the name of this file because it was number key press and then inside the function's name is numeric key press. And that's annoying. So I changed the name of the file. The only thing you have to make sure you do is bring in the right one. But all this is done in jQuery. Some of the rest of this stuff I still use in other places, so it's there. I've got three buttons on the form. Everything else is here. Nothing terribly exciting. I will explain some of this stuff as we get into it. For each table, we're going to create a library. So I've got an employees library, you got a plants library, you got a trips library. Even though I don't have any views to handle plants, to edit plants and all that, I still have a model file so that when I need a list of plants, I ask the plants model to give it to me. Occasionally, when you want a list of stuff from three or four different tables with one query, the challenge becomes, where do I put the function that gets that for me? Try to put it in a logical place is all I can recommend. But a lot of these, I need a list of employees. Well, that should be in the employees model. I need a list of plants. Should be in the plants model, and so on. Each one of the models is going to have multiple functions for every type of CRUD processing that you want to do. So there'll be a delete employees function that will incorporate the SQL command to delete an employee. There'll be an update employees. There'll be a save or a save new employee function. And one of the first ones we're going to do is generate a list of employees. So I have a list that I can choose from. So every SQL command you want to execute is going to be inside its own function. Those functions will do the SQL magic, collect the data. The data gets put into an associative array, or actually an array of associative arrays, because if you collect records, each record is an associative array. So if I say, go out and get me employees, I'm going to get one record with an employee ID, an employee first name, last name, salary, all that other stuff. If there's a bunch of records returned, then I get an array of those. Each one of them is associated by field name. We'll talk more about what we get out of the database and how to process it as we go along here. So the ultimate result here is with the, the controller, it's going to call the function. We write the commands in the controller. 
if I'm going to generate a list of employees, I, the programmer, have to know that I need this and this and this from the database, however many it is. For a list, it's one. I call the appropriate function. The function does its job, sends me an array. The array is now available to the view because it's in the controller. So now the view can look at that array and process it and spit all kinds of stuff out. Insert, update, and delete commands don't return a result set, meaning they don't send you back a list of records. Just select commands to do that. They don't send you back a list of records, but they do send back a count. If we said delete everything that starts with the letter K, that might be 25 records. The delete command for that SQL would return a 25, and if we wanted to, we could send that back to the controller. I don't normally process that way. So when we write functions to insert, update, and delete, I normally send back the count just in case, but I never use it. It's easy to return it. Whether I use it or not in the controller is up to me, and maybe somebody else will modify this in the future and want to display that 25 records were deleted or 13 records were updated. Well, what usually happens is one was updated. We will be using prepared statements. This is part of the PDO class. And what we're trying to avoid here is what Jason was talking about the last time he stuck his head in the door, and that is SQL injection. SQL injection, you can read about it here on Wikipedia. There's a video here that talks about it. It's good to kind of have your head around what they're talking about. But people who know SQL will try to insert into a WHERE clause other SQL that actually opens up the database and unlocks it and shows all the usernames and passwords. And if you write the right SQL, you can overpower an SQL command and get access to the whole database. That's a short description of it. The Wikipedia has got a big old long thing. The video is good because it shows you a couple of examples of how they insert into a WHERE clause a command that actually gives them, it's a security hole, gives them an access, gives them access to the database. It's easy to avoid. SQL injection is easy to avoid. So I'm going to show you how. The way we avoid it is we take whatever the user types in as their what kind of person you're looking for. You might have a search clause. What are you searching for? I'm searching for all the employees named Dunn. Well, instead of typing Dunn, an SQL hacker would type in some little SQL magic stuff in there, and that then gets inserted into your SQL. By using parameters, their SQL hacking stuff, those are almost, they are SQL commands, they don't work. And so this class, PDO class, is part of that. It's part of the security that we want. There are some simpler ways, but they're not that much simpler. Prepared statements allow you to separate the query definition from the user's inputs, and that's what avoids, that's what avoids the, the injections. So what the user put in in a search box, even in a first name box, could potentially be used to cause some kind of security issues. To create a prepared statement, we first, and this one I'm going to do without parameters. This one doesn't have a WHERE clause. Right? Most of the time, the WHERE clause is what catches these parameters. What do you want to look for? I want to search for people whose last name is done. Well, that's a WHERE clause, where the last name is done or something like that. The so WHERE clause is usually where parameters go. This one doesn't have any. It's just a simple query. First thing I define is a variable called my query, and I put the query in there. This query will change a little bit, but you should recognize the query just a standard give me everything out of that table query. That's just a string. That string then gets sent. There's my DB object. That's the one that was created by my connection file. That's my connection to the database. It's an object. PHP, instead of dots, you use the dash arrow to access a method. And there's a prepare method. This doesn't execute the query. This simply takes in the query that we wrote up here and brings it into the class. 
and you all know enough about class concepts now to know there's all kinds of things that can happen inside that class. This is almost like instantiating it. Except it's already instantiated. What we're doing is telling it, hey, you pointer, get ready. We're going to execute this query. But it doesn't tell it to execute. The next line says execute. Why couldn't they combine those? In a little while when we add parameters, they go in between. Then once the query has been executed, the result set, this is a little bizarre, takes a little getting used to, actually gets stored inside of my statement object. This is an instantiation of DB. So when we get the answers, it's inside here, inside a statement. It doesn't get put into a separate location. The answer to this query, whatever it is, gets stored inside a statement as well. So when you're ready, which is usually next, you say, get me all of the records that you were returned from that query. There is a fetch and there's a fetch all. Fetch all retrieves all records. Fetch retrieves, re retrieves one. And we can use a for loop to re retrieve them one at a time. Murex says if what you're retrieving from the database is huge, don't use fetch all because it'll start clogging up your server's memory. And if you've got thousands of records, I've seen this, you can get errors too. Serve the, the SQL server will come back and say, I'm sorry, I'm not storing that for you. It's too big. I typically use fetch all because hopefully my queries are well enough written that I'm not bringing in more than a couple, 3,000 records, and that shouldn't bother anybody. It's when you get up into the half million records that things get a little ugly. The This is a flag. The flag at the end here says only fetch an associative array. For some reason, the fetch all function method was written to generate basically two intermixed arrays, one that is indexed. So here's record number zero, or here's row number, record number zero. Here's record number one, here's record number two, here's record number three. Inside there, here's field number zero, field number one, field number two, field number three. In addition to that, they also create employee ID field, associative array, where it's keyed on, employee, on the field name, employee ID, first name, last name. And for the longest time, that was causing grief. And last year, somebody discovered how to tell it to, don't give me the indexed array, I'm not going to use it. It saves half the result set because it duplicated it so that you could walk through it by index if you really wanted to, or you could walk through it by name. I turned this feature off on that page that you all have been going to to test my HTML. Because what field set do I expect when you send your sample to my echo list? It's a varying field set every single time. And so what I do instead is use an index to go through them. Go from 0 to 10 if there's 10 fields that were sent and spit out their information. But in every one of our queries, I'm not interested in the indexed version, so this says just send me an associative array, don't send me the indexed version. If you leave that out, you get both. Finally, like with any file processing, you close. This releases your access to the database. Just because you have it open by executing this command doesn't mean that other people can't access the database. But there's limits to how many open connections there can be to a database. We should never come close. And when you're running off your stick, you're never going to get there because it's only you. But even when we post this for Lions Camp, I can't imagine overpowering our database more than Amazon, eBay, all the multiple users they have. It should never be an issue. But it's still a good idea to close it. If you don't, the next time your program tries to execute a query, It'll open another connection. Now your program's got two connections. Poor programming. So this is the basic layout of every single query. The only thing that really changes, well, not the only thing, but you definitely change the SQL command. And if you have parameters, they get stuck in between here, between the prepare and the execute. I'll show you how to do that. And then maybe you fetch instead of fetch all, but most of the time it's a fetch all. So selects to joins are all in the SQL statement. Pardon me? And selects to join are all in the SQL statement. Yeah. What if you want to order by? Does that go Did you just keep typing? 
Just this, this is a brief example. Order by, where, having, you name it, it all goes in there. But order by has to come after where. Yeah. So still still goes in there, but you use parameters. That's for of. that. Okay. It's just a string, okay? And I can concatenate variables to the string. I can do whatever I want. At the end, it better be a valid SQL command. What I will often do is go into the workbench if I can't get it to work right. Go into the workbench, type it, make it work in the workbench, paste it back in here, and take out the stuff that's varying. This is the SQL command. <coughs> this PDO class, this statement guy here, is what ultimately knows how to execute it. Yes, it's just a variable name. I call it statement because when you read the documentation, that's what the DB prepare command sends back as a statement. Seems a little weird, right? But that's what they call it. And then we execute that statement, but the statement also has parameters in it. And what's weird is the statement then holds the results when you're done. But yes, you can name it whatever you want. It kind of morphs as you go along here, so I picked their name and stuck with it. All right, so it's supposed to be time to go do this. First of all, let's go to the cases, if you want to follow along. I'm going to the cases. Nope, change that index. Because I want to change the default action. Right now, the default action takes me to my employee details, only because if I don't do that, I got nothing to look at. I don't have a list. I haven't generated it yet. So what I want to do is change the default action from employee details to employee list. That way I can test my employee list thing over and over and over again. And once the employee list thing is done, then I use it to access other data later on. So this is the kind of stuff some of you were talking about before class about how about if we have a list of addresses that we can choose from. That's what I'm going to show you how to do first. It's very common. So now our first action will always be employee lists. So now we can go to the employee cases. And here in the employee list, I said, show me this view. Well, without any data, that view doesn't do anything. So here's what we're working on. We want to be able to generate an employee list. We're going to use this view to display it. But before we can display the list, we got to go get it. I'm going to check my employee model. And I already have get employee details in there. Whoops, that's details. I already have a function for get the employee list so we don't have to type so much. But notice all the different functions, including a validation function, including a details function. Everything you ever wanted to get about employees or do to employees goes in here. Think of this as the methods of a class, of a business class. We're not building a class. Marek never showed me how. Not that I couldn't figure it out. We could build a class. But really all the class ever does is these things. Data PHP classes don't store data except while you're on the server for an instant. They do things. So instead of creating a class just so we can stick methods in there, we put them in a model file instead. It's just a bunch of methods. So here's my employee list. This is where I now have to start stealing that code from over there. The first thing we need to do, however, if we're going to access our database pointer is get access to it. And remember in PHP, if you want global variables inside of a function, you got to ask for them. So every one of these functions is going to start out with that. There's no way around it other than potentially creating a super global variable of some kind, sticking it in there. But that's not anything I've ever seen before. So every one of our data access functions does this, and a very common mistake, and it doesn't take long to find it, is to forget that. And it goes, never heard of DB, and you go, stupid, what do you mean? Never, oh, geez, forgot to tell it to get access to it. It's very common. All right, next thing I want is a query. So I'm going to create a variable called my query, and you can call this just a variable. Call it whatever you want. And I'm going to select star from, is it still TBL employees or did I change that? It's probably TBL. still TBL. Sorry. 
meant to change it. It's not my list. TBL employees. Semicolons don't hurt. I don't think they're necessary. That's the semicolon for the SQL. Did I do that? No, nope, didn't do it in there. It gets a little confusing when you have two semicolons. Semicolons separate SQL commands, right? If you wanted to create a query that is really a procedure, multiple SQL commands, you can do it. Just put semicolons between them. I've never done it. So since I only am ever executing one SQL command, I don't need to put a semicolon on it, but the PHP command needs a semicolon. Does procedures also help in SQL injections, or does that not really? I don't know. I don't know. The procedures, if they, they, could, they, if they have parameters, or if they have inputs from the user that are not parameterized, I could see them being injected. They're just really what are procedures? They're just SQL statements, multiples. And so if they have a place where you insert this variable and it's not a parameter, we've got a problem. Because technically I could do this, right? Where the last name equals, and then I can concatenate. Shouldn't be using double quotes here, Justin. Help me out. Keep an eye on me. Right. Or John, whoever it was. All right. And then I can concatenate, and you said comma. Can't do that, though, because I'm not echoing. So I can concatenate a variable called last name. And that works fine. It creates an SQL statement. And it only gives you the people with that last name. However, this is not parameterized. We'll learn how to do it in a minute. So that's subject to SQL injection. It's that kind of statement that can make your database insecure. It's a Larry double quotes add than because it has to analyze the inside of the string. PHP analyzes the inside of the string, and I don't have any variables embedded inside. Okay, so, it's less efficient. so it would be less efficient. Um, is the SQL statement uh, case sensitive? No. Uh, careful. No. It's not until we start processing the array that comes out of it that the names that we used in here. I used a star. Right? If I typed in there employee ID, all lowercase, that's what comes out. Because employee ID is a variable, is a field name, all lowercase. If I type it employee capital I D, and I try to access it later using my associative array, I have to capitalize properly there. So my advice is capitalizing the same way you do in the database, which is basically Camelback. This database, I think I did change it so the IDs are all lowercase d's. That's just table names and database names. And even they are not case sensitive. That's just what they do to them. So I don't think they're case sensitive. All right, so there's my query. After the query, now I need to create my statement. And these, you can, I don't know if I can steal them from here or not. If I can, I will sit and wait while you watch, or type, I should say. Cool. So I'll wait for you to type those since you can't cut and paste unless you happen to have the website open. Those four commands, I cut and paste a lot. The only thing that I occasionally do is put the word results here instead. So I don't have this variable name that keeps changing on me every time I run a query. The query results always go into results. So I pasted that, but I'm going to change it to results. Now I can cut and paste all of this stuff over and over and over again in most of my queries. I had a couple of people in the past make that into a function. You send it a query, it sends you an array back gets a little confusing to me. It's only four or five lines, and if you throw parameters in, it gets worse. So it doesn't make a real good function once the parameters are part of it. Now, I should have results. How are we doing, typists? I don't want to do it. Okay? I don't want to do what Sean does and say, okay, I'll give you 30 seconds to type what I pasted in you know, a couple. But. You know the second. 
Well, yeah, if I'm trying to follow them, I mean, it's a great lesson for me to be a student in that class. I've tried slowing down and explaining a few things. You know. That's in the recording, though. Yeah, it is. He doesn't listen to my stuff. He's got better things to do. You can point it out to him if you wish. Dear Sean, listen to this recording at time stamp 40 minutes and 10 seconds. He's not your boss anymore. No, he's not my boss anymore. And another time we'll make some easy accents. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I believe this is done, at least for what we needed to do right now is our very first example. So when we call this function get employee list, it's going to send us an array of records where each record is an associative array of fields and their values, key value pairs. Anybody see what's coming out? Okay, so back to our cases now. I guess I should save that. Back to the cases. Here, what I want to do now, before I display my view, and this is the way it usually works, you do all your calling things. Notice how I'm calling all these functions. You do all your calling first, and then at the end, once you've got all your data collected, then you display the view. So here, I want to create a variable. I think here I'm going to call it imps, because these are employees that I'm getting, is equal to get employee list. Now, did that function, I'm going to flip back and forth on you here a second. Well, let's just do it this way. Horizontal split and cases. That's where I am. This one. Okay. This has a parameter. Well, that's details. I'm sorry. Here's get employee list. No parameters. This just gets a list. We will tweak this so that it doesn't always get me all 3,000 records. If I do a search, I'll narrow that down. We'll tweak it before we're done. But for right now, I get the employee list, parentheses, semicolon. This does all the database stuff. I did close the cursor, just checking myself here. Closes the cursor, gives me an array. That's now stored in EMPS. And it's almost break time, so I'm only going to do one simple thing. We're going to go to employee list. This is an array. I should be able to print R it and may, or print array it and have it come out on the screen all gross and ugly, but we can see the data that came out. Go ahead, Justin. Uh, on bigger sites, would you require model sizes for every statement for employees not on the outside? Before? By the time we're done, employees is needed here. It's needed here. It's needed everywhere. So it's better to just. I put it on the outside, otherwise you're copying it into every single case. Because I need, you can. I was just wondering what best. Okay. Plants, that one, I need it for here and here, so I'm not in one case. I suppose you could move it. I, I do it once. It's basically how much you need it. Like, Pardon me? It's basically it's, Yeah, it's pretty much there. It's server side. Yeah. Right? And hopefully my server's got lots of memory and lots of storage. and Shouldn't be too much trouble. This stuff is not, this is all PHP stuff. It is not going to the browser. It's not going to make your web page any bigger. And because every single case needs it, I've been telling you since programming logic beginning, if every single case needs it, get it outside. Plants is close. That's a design decision. There. So let's switch now to the view. Save that. So now I'm ready for this view. And I'm going to quickly check my utilities here because I want to make sure that print array is in here. Format phone is date. Print array is there. All right. So we can go to the employee list view. Right now it doesn't do much, but I did include my header and my footer. I did, oops, still got an ID main. Let's change that because I forgot. But here you can imagine all of, I keep calling it Justin stuff, but all the bootstrap divs and all this stuff that we want we can break this list up into multiple columns and do whatever we want with it. But really all I want to do right now is a PHP command to print array. That's my function that I wrote that puts pre-tags around my array. And the array I want to print is the emp array. I want to see it. 
everybody know where the everybody see where the emperor ray came from Emps, thank you. It came from my cases. The cases got it from the model. So I, the model gave me a bunch of data. It got stored in Emps. That now is available to this view because they're all at the same level. Fingers crossed. And I think I'm just going to restart this whole page. Bingo. So this is also very valuable to look at. Notice what you get. You get an indexed array of records. Each record is a key value pair. So this print array with the pre-tags around it gives you a nice look at what's coming out of your database and we can scroll to 49 employees, 50. I rarely use these numbers. At this point, I'm now going to use, when we come back from break, I'm now going to use a for each loop and say for each employee that's here, do this to them. But this at least gives me a view of what I got. It's a great way to build in pieces. Good. My function worked. It transferred that information back to the class or to the controller. The controller's got the right default action. I got a lot of things I just tested here. And that data is visible to the, to the GUI, so now the GUI can start spitting out that however we want to spit it out. So let's pause there. When we come back, we'll pretty this up.